I'm going to say something that's going to blow this thing wide open. The reason the Eastland sank is because of the Titanic. Wow. Live from the North Adams Memorial Library in North Adams, Michigan, America's Captain, Daryl Walton. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. Yeah. You know what's going to make us when we finally get a chance to do this live on the Arthur M. Anderson. Ooh. That's going to happen, I tell you. It's going to happen one of these You've days. You've been saying that, Arthur M. Anderson. Well, and, of course, we know that last year would have been the year to do that because they wintered in Toledo, but this yeah. year the Anderson... Is wintering where? Superior. Okay. Fraser Shipyard. Anyway, let's jump into the Eastland, uh, a ship that suffered great tragedy in the Chicago River on July 24th, 1915. Uh, just a few notes before we blast off. Built by the Michigan Steamship Company, uh, launched May 6th, 1903. She was tagged with the name the Speed Queen of the Great Lakes. And of course, she was a beautiful ship and she carried passengers. Her captain in the beginning was Harry Peterson, a passenger ship based in Chicago, although she did serve over this way. It was a regular between Cedar Point and Cleveland for a time before it got sold back uh, or sold off to a company that brought it back to its base in Chicago. And anyway, this ship rolled over right at the dock in the Chicago River. And what's Really interesting to me, and I didn't know this, but the Eastland has the largest loss of life on a from a single shipwreck in Great Lakes history, and it never left the dock. I, that just blows my mind. Where are you on this thing? Well, first of all, <clears throat> here's the book I took, because obviously everybody's long gone that was a participant in this. Okay, the Eastland Disaster Writer. This is the book. I took everything from Ashes Underwater by Michael McCarthy. So you already had that. Pardon you me? just had to dig that out of your stash, yeah, right? My, uh, well, I like to call it my archives, but yeah, could be my stash, you know? <laughs> <laughs> cut, cut, no. That, uh, anyway, no, it, uh, <clears throat> when they started running Cleveland to Cedar Point, and I'm going to tell this because I know we got people watching from all over the world, folks. The greatest amusement park in the world is Cedar Point, Ohio. And I was there when I was five years old. My aunt took me out to first first ferry boat right first time I ever saw the Northern Lights. I was five years old on oh, Cedar Point. But long story short, coming from Cleveland to Cedar Point, it seemed like every week the passenger count became less and less and less and less and less because she was a miserable, rotten boat to ride on. It was a terrible ride. She, you know, you just, you know, flat, calm sea, you're doing this all the way over. Well, women can't handle this stuff. As a marine surveyor. It was top heavy, too, right? Well, yeah. I'm, we'll get I, to that. I'm going to get to that. Right. But she had a rounded bottom. Uh, when I did marine surveys on the old pacemakers, it was an old wooden boat. Because the minute you stepped on that boat, it'd heel over this way. And you had to sit perfect. Could you imagine on the seaway doing this whole thing? And that's why people didn't like riding on the Eastland. And then she had several modifications as the years went on. But in this particular case, uh, she was based over Chicago, as you said, and the Western Electric Company, who made all the telephones for Alexander Graham Bell. And when the telephones first started coming, he, Western Electric made all the receivers and the t actual telephone. And they were the owner of the ship when it went down. Yeah. They just chartered the boat. I see. They'd actually I, I chartered, wondered about that. Okay. They'd actually chartered three or four or five different boats. They had all kinds of employees going out there. The original capacity of that easel was 2,700 people. Very interesting fact coming out why why that had to change. They had to count them as they came aboard. When they got to 2,500, they had to stop. Here's here's the gist of the whole thing. This poor guy, and we'll get into him. This poor guy's name was Joseph Erickson. He was the chief engineer on the boat. This boat had a bogus ballasting system. Okay, 
The boat sitting at the dock. It had a gangplank four feet by eight feet wide, eight, four feet wide, eight feet long. Now remember, think of the time. These women wore these real long dresses. You know, I know mini skirts yet. You know, that big long. You've seen pictures. Oh, of them. sure, right and down to the ankles. The boats up here, and again, they couldn't get on the boat. So the captain says, down. He calls down the engine room. He says, "Hey, put put a couple of ballast tanks full of water." And get that boat. They started it to lean on purpose, so so they get the gangway straight, so the people can get on board. Oh, in my opinion, red flag number one. But then again, I wasn't there. I'm just going with what the book. Th that was just red flag number one from that terrible yes. day. Yes, there were lots of red flags to get there. Go ahead. Now, as they keep boarding that boat, of course, the boat's going to get lower and lower. Now it's starting to drizzle. It's starting to rain. So most of the people didn't go on the upper deck. They went down below because it was damp, and they wanted to warm damp, up. Damp, exactly right. So now it's almost too low, right? Now it's going this way. So the captain goes, hey, either pump it out, which is what I would have done, pumped it out, right, to bring the thing up. But the chief engineer put it on the other side of the boat. So, and, and the problem was they had one seacock to handle all this. So the pumps took a while to do this, okay? They're pumping out from the, from the one side to the dock side to the river side. And when they did, and all these other people, then the boat shifted because the passenger shifted. Now she's leaning over dangerously to the riverside. And at 7 at seven a.m., they had 1,600 people aboard. Now, you and I both ran the air one at Queen. 572 people on that boat was a lot of freaking people. Seemed like it to me. I can't imagine. 1,600, 2,500 people. Anyway, at uh, at 727, she was listing toward the riverside at a 25-degree list. But by then, they had even more uh, uh, right. passengers they, on. They just counted the, the 2,500 people on their passengers and they said sorry you gotta we'll leave and the other boat will come in and you get on that boat and she learned some more and all of a sudden over she went i mean and, and just like that quick it was over and it was gone it was done and the, the boat was only uh let's see it was 265 feet long 38 feet on the beam but she drew 19 feet six inches the water was only 19 20 feet deep there so if the boat's laying on half the boat's out of the water sideways and a lot of people were able to crawl up on the and be saved but them poor people down below, they never had a chance. This is something like 844. 844 people total died on the Eastland that day. But if you were already down below, which where most of the people were, because they're warm enough, it's early morning. They started boarding at 6.30 a.m. and were done boarding at 7.10. That's just 40 minutes and full to capacity, capacity at 2,572 passengers. Uh, but yes, most of those people uh, were below and most of them died and drowned in a hurry. Some of them were crushed. I mean, this thing fell over at a 90 degree angle, sitting there in 20 feet of water approximately. Some were, you know, crushed by pianos and tables and Well, they had a band playing. It was ter right? terrible. You think of a band playing now, they're usually four, I played a band for years with four guys in a band, maybe five. They had a 26 piece orchestra down there on the dance floor and people were seven o'clock and we're dancing and stuff. So. And as she heeled over, everybody started sliding like, like like in the fun house, you know, you go on that big slide, you know. And the band members couldn't even keep their feet. And the piano and stuff, and you're right, when she went over, that piano, bam, went down and crushed a couple of people. And they never had a chance to get up. Because this engineer, now here's, I want to talk about heroics, okay? You talk about a chief engineer not deserting his post. He's trying his best, right, to right this boat. And it, she's going over it. And, and you and I both know from the test we had to take, there's a writing moment on a boat, and there's stability letters that, that boats have to adhere to, okay? In other words, you can have so many people on one side, and she's not supposed to go over. And if she doesn't pass those tests, you don't get the stability letter, and you don't get to run the boat. He's trying to write in this boat one seacock. He's already told him, he'd only been on there two months. He said, you got to get, you got to, this is this is antiquated. You got to have at least one more seacock here to speed this up, because you it's taking forever with this. He stayed down there. And the uh, the water kept coming up and coming up and coming up until it got to his chest, because he had to he was reversing the flow to the boilers to get to, to cool the temperature down there. Otherwise, because that cold water hit the boilers, she'd have blown sky high and killed everybody immediately. Just like the Sultana on the Mississippi River, we talked about that. Talked you know? about that. You do not want the boilers to blow and be anywhere near it. Trust me, you don't. Well, I mean, nowhere near it. So anyway, he did that, and at the last minute, he, he knew he was going to die. And the water came up, and he was able to get through a, some kind of skylight or something up there. Somebody pulled him to safety. But what that poor man went through, eventually, it would have been better if he just took a couple of gulps and ended it. Because they put this poor guy. Did he die? Uh, well, no, not then. No, no. But the point being, 
uh, all these people, and, 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 and this is the sickening part of this whole deal. The owners of the boat got wind of this, and they took a train immediately over to Chicago. Now, don't you think if you're the owner of a boat and you got a disaster here, it killed a lot, a lot of people, you're going to go down there and supervise it. Yeah, no, they get down there and they go to lunch. The cops arrested them right now. I said, Remember, they told Phillips, we're going, we're going to the other owner here at this real expensive restaurant in Chicago. And they went and had a leisurely lunch. And that was the guy's name was uh, Walter Steele. Who was he? Walter Steele was one of the owners of the, of the boat. Okay. And um, meanwhile, going on, Dozens of undertakers started grossly inflating the cost of coffins, knowing because Western Electric said they were going to foot the bill for the Someone's thing. turning the buck here. Oh, to... yeah, I think. No, not in our <laughs> country. They wouldn't do that, would they? Never heard that before. But on a tragedy off the heels of that. Uh... They found a teenager boy going through the pockets of the dead people. When they caught him, he had fistfuls of cash that he'd taken out of people. He said, now how macabre is that? Satanic. Okay. Evil, and right away you had people with sandwich boards. You know what sandwich? They walk around and go, eat at Joe's, you know, you know this that. Yeah. Come see the bodies. Ten cents. Ten cents per look. You know. They yeah. ain't even got them all out of the water yet. It was a different. One era. girl they hauled up. Well, she'd been in the water. I don't know how long. And they're hauling her up a gangway. She's on the thing, and all of a sudden somebody screams, "She's moving! She's moving!" And, and they pulled the cover back, and she, she revived. She's heading for the morgue, you know, but uh, she, she made it. So, unfortunately, 22 entire families bit the dust because it was raining. They took the families down below, the kids and stuff. And uh, when she went over, there was no hope. The electricity went off at that exact same time the chief engineer went up. So now it's pitch dark below. Can you imagine the horror no. of that? I just, I just, I just, uh, you know, now all boats have emergency lighting, you know, and they didn't have that stuff in those days. In less than 20 minutes, 844 people dead. I mean, that's how fast yep. this happened. And Chief uh, Engineer Erickson had only been with the boat for two months. So he did not know the peculiarities. Every boat has peculiarities, how she handles this, that, and whatever. You know, just... Every boat acts differently. Absolutely. So he didn't have a chance to really understand a lot about this stuff. And once he started to heal over, to me, you know, if, you, if you've got the thing down so so... The women in their long dresses can get aboard. Well, that's all good. But when you go this way, you got to pump out again, you know. But instead, you put it on the other side for whatever reason. So now you got all this water on the other side. It comes up here. Now she healed. That's why she healed over that way. Because now you don't have the water on on, on the uh, dock side. You've got it on the river side. Whether people shipped it on one side, there was there was rumors at the trial, and I'll get into that in a minute. All the people all went over to the top deck to see this boat. No, no, no. They interviewed so many survivors, that wasn't the case at all. They put this poor guy through the river. They had, they had, um, they're going to have a coroner's inquest, I think. So, but before they, they have the big trial in Chicago, okay, they're going to have the coroner's inquest and the first trial over in Grand Rapids, Michigan, because the guys that, six of the crew members were from Grand Rapids. This guy, he got, he got this attorney. He got this young attorney. He's, 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 you know, just trying to make a buck, right? And he's in his office. And the door opens and in walks this guy who looks like he has death warmed over. Eyes sunken way back in his head. It's obvious the guy ain't eaten in weeks. He just looks like death warmed over. Came in, sat down, and introduced himself. My name is Joseph Erickson. I was chief engineer on the Eastland. Can you please help me? Turns out that attorney, his name was Clarence Darrell who later became this world-famous attorney, started with the Eastland. He ended up doing the Scopes Monkey Trial. I don't know if you're aware of that. It was a big trial between the Bible and evolution, you know. Uh, they made movies about it. Everything else. But this Clarence Darrell was a pretty sharp lawyer. It all stemmed down to that they should have had that second sea cut, but they never did it. They never did because they had to put all the light. There was a bunch of expenditures going, well, we'll get to this maybe in dry dock or whenever, you know, but they never did get to it. So anyway, the trial starts. Very interesting here, buddy. Ah, over in Grand Rapids. The guy's the judge here. Really, the trial for the Eastland was in Grand Rapids, Michigan? Yeah, because the crew, the ones they're putting on trial were from Grand Rapids. It's, okay. a court, it, it's not the actual grand jury in Chicago because Clarence Darrow said, you can't get a fair trial for these guys over there. I mean, they'll kill them over there. <laughs> you know how many families were directly involved? 
right? I mean, how many people worked at Western Electric? Almost half of Chicago. We knew somebody or a neighbor or whatever, or aunt, uncle, whatever. So he, he argued that, hey, uh, they sent divers down, and, and one diver said, because they said he didn't have the seacock open all the way. And Clarence Dell says, how do you know he didn't? Well, because uh, you could tell by, by opening. No, was, no, wait a minute, he says, did you have a flashlight with you? Could you see it? No, it's pitch dark. He says, well, how could you tell how open it was? See, he threw doubt in the jury's mind, the judge's mind. You're just a judge panel right now is what we got going on. And the judge there, this is very interesting, who that guy turned out to be. Dr. I'm sorry, Judge Clarence Sessions. He was presiding over it. Out of this trial, they ended up making him the first commissioner of Major League Baseball. You know, you think of the big leagues and stuff, they got a commissioner. Right? Well, he turned out to be the first one. The trial went on and on and on, and a lot of passengers testified that top heavy all along, you know, but it was never, it was, and they added stuff onto it. But I still say the Titanic lifeboat situation really pushed her over the edge. When it was all said and done, the ruling was that uh, the crew was not to be held liable because they had made a deal that each surviving passenger and the estate of the ones that died were going to be entitled to $10,000 a piece from the boat line and, and uh, Western Electric. When it was all said and done, everybody got off. And nobody got a dime. Nobody, so nobody got 10000 apiece? No, uh, not a dime. Not according to this book. Now, if they did future litigation, I don't know. This is the book I'm going by. Now, the guy the guy couldn't get over it because, I mean, could you imagine knowing that you were the one doing it and 844 people died? And he just his health kept going down, 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 down until he finally just died of a heart attack. And years later, they just, in, in a court of public opinion, they blamed him. But you and I both know as captains, the buck stops with the captain. Gee, captain, maybe you shouldn't have, he shouldn't have lowered her down, you know, and then put her back the other way, you know. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. You know, it's always the same thing. I'm going to say something that's going to blow this thing wide open. And I'm waiting to see your response. I'm watching you real close. <laughs> Folks, I'm watching him real close here, so take my word for that's it. serious pressure. The reason the Eastland sank is because of the Titanic. Whoa. Okay. Ah. Um, are you talking about a comparison, a connection, nope. a little Here bit of both? Go. So the Titanic Ab sank in 1912. That's correct. It's 1915 That's now. That's correct. Three but years later. In the intervening, after the, all the the boards of investigation on the, in the American side about the Titanic and on the England side, they all got together and they said, we're going to change this. From here on out, 